Welcome, everyone. My name is Heather Semino, and I am an adult program specialist here at New Canaan Library, or virtually here. Uh, I want to uh, thank you all for adjusting to Zoom tonight. I think um, after walking on the icy sidewalk earlier this evening, I think it was a good call that we're doing this via Zoom. So with that, um, talk about the program tonight. We are happy to be partnering with Staying Put of New Canaan to bring you a series of events uh, and programs about aging, and tonight is our first one, and it's about senior care. Um, we have Paul and Susan Doyle of Oasis Senior Advisors here to give us an overview of the whole process of the care continuum, starting from home and um, moving on to nursing home. Um, and with that, I, I'd like to hand it over to Robin Bates Mason, who has um, some more information to share with. So thanks again. Hi, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much, Heather. Once again, I'm Robin Bates Mason. I'm with Staying Put in New Canaan, and we are thrilled to be partnering with Susan and Paul Doyle of Oasis Senior Advisors, New Canaan Library for the Sandwich Generation Seminar Series. Um, staying put is all about helping older adults stay put in the community and age confidently in the town they love. And we are open to all New Canaan residents. Uh, if you'd like more information about Staying Put New Canaan, please visit our website, stayingputnc.org, or you can call our office at 203-966-7762. Uh, thank you so much for attending on this incredibly icy night. It's great to be on Zoom. And now for Susan and Paul Doyle of Oasis Senior Advisors. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thanks for everybody coming. Um, a little bit on the overview. Uh, tonight we get basically uh, the core curriculum. Uh, we're going to talk about everything in senior care, and it's going to be about the 10,000-foot view. We'll get a lot of information in here, so it will be a bit overwhelming. But think of this as a series. And if you look at the roster of or the schedule of events coming in the coming months, you'll get opportunities to really dive down deeply into many of these issues, whether they be clinical or legal, uh, financial. Um, they're all part of this. And this, to start off with navigating senior care, will give you the breadth of what you'll be seeing in, in the coming months. Um, so as I said, we'll be 10,000 foot view tonight, but I think in about an hour, you'll realize that even a 10,000 foot view that this can be uh, a bit overwhelming. So thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Susan. Uh, and so uh, we've been in business for eight years and we serve Westchester and Fairfield counties. Um, Oasis Senior Advisors, we're a free service. We really help people navigate senior care. We kind of got into this because um, we were our own clients, basically, um, starting with Paul's parents, his mother had Alzheimer's, his father had 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 um had a cancer, um, and just having to navigate home care, hospice, legal, financial, all this stuff. We didn't know what to do. There was really no um no source, uh, there was no guidance, right? No single person to go to. So it was really, really frustrating. So as we started to deal with our own family issues and friends and things like that, we became the resources and we're able to share this information with people. And that's what our business is. It's really to help people navigate um, the, the different options as we go forward. So tonight uh, we're going to be talking about how to get from here to there. Okay. And I just took a, a little Google map here and I found a, a place, one happy, healthy life, which is, I think some uh, practice up in uh, New Milford, uh, just to keep it light. But I use this as uh, sort of an example of what the road looks like. You know, we've all seen the GPS and we can map out what we want for care. And But there are junctions along the way. There are times you got to get on Route 7 and it gets a little dicey. Uh, there are thickets of bad traffic and there are things that we just don't see. Um, in fact, we all know that if we set Google up going at 2.30, at about 2.45, everything's going to change when the school buses get out there and throw us new impediments to our, our track. So the, like any, any guidance, um, that's what we're looking for here um, or what we're going to see here. You really don't know what's going to come. Senior care is very, very bespoke. Um, so we're going to show you how to navigate that as best as best you can by educating you in what those junctures are uh, and where the choke points might be um, in, in, in your traffic. Um, so let's begin with sort of what are the, the, the questions or the red flags, the inflection points that uh, that would cause me to think about this. 
Now, plenty of people say, oh, I'm going to wait for an event. And the worst thing you can do is start to put your plan together bedside at a rehab or in a hospital. I think that's really, really clear to everybody. Um, and everybody's a little bit afraid to, uh, to say, oh, you know, we really need to talk about that because we have this apprehension that it means we're frail or we're weak or we're getting near the end. But it really doesn't. It just means we're being prudent about making yeah. a plan as we would with anything. Um, but some of the questions, rather than waiting for a hospital stay or uh, a rehab stint, um, the things to look about uh, would be, is everybody safe overnight? Are you okay being there overnight? Is your loved one okay? Um, well, I just, no, no, I, I can, I can walk away from this thing. Um, can, uh, is everybody safe overnight? Um, and, and that the, the quickest manifestation of that is in driving. We get that all the time. So ah, I'm a little uncomfortable. I get that way. Like staring into the, the, the lights, the car is coming on, all that kind of stuff. Um, we look at that. Does that shut down somebody's uh, life to a degree because they're limits? Are there limitations and dangers of the house? Do you get worried about somebody navigating in and around their house because they're uh, less steady on their feet uh, or just stiff? Uh, memory loss, pretty self-apparent. If people are forgetting things, um, you know, in a conversation, what does that mean manifested in the rest of their life? What are they not equipped to do um, because of memory loss? Um, medications, medications are great. They help us uh, uh, and they carry us through difficult times. But if we're not using them right, we're not using there. It, it can be a real disaster. Um, so are we good and consistent on them? Are we compliant? The final thing we'll talk about in this, because uh, you'll hear about this throughout the con care continuum, are ADLs. And those are activities of daily living. Basically, those are dressing, bathing, toileting, transferring, and mobility. Transferring, I'll give you an example of what high care would mean. Something um, as simple as getting out of a chair. Well, if you have trouble getting out of a chair or getting in and out of a bed or on and off a toilet and you need assistance on that, think about how many times you do that in a given day. Um, that would be a fair amount of care if you needed somebody to help you. Just a just something as simple as a, a, a hand underneath your armpit or on your elbow to get you out of a chair or out of bed, on and off a toilet. Uh, that means a lot of care. But something much less threatening might be something like uh, compression socks. Plenty of people use compression socks, but they're really difficult to get on and off. And if you can't get them on or off, they're not going to be effective because you're not going to put them on. Or if you have arthritis and it flares up in the morning and you can't get your pajamas off, you can't do those buttons. Okay. The quickest reaction to that is, well, I guess I can't take my pajamas off and I sit around my pajamas all day. So those are really banal little things, but they're indicators that maybe we should be thinking about putting some care plan in place. So so what are the roles, right? There's different kinds of roles that we, we look at when, we're, um, when we think about caregiving. What does the person need to do? Is it hands-on care? Like Paul was saying, does, do you, does someone need to help you to, to transfer or just to be there um, if you're unsteady? What about driving? Do you need someone to do to run errands for you, to do some shopping, right? Um, doctor's appointments, so important as we go older, get older. And it doesn't even need to be someone who's getting older, you know, to have someone there to listen to what the doctor says, if there's, you know, a change in condition and even to make those appointments, right. To make sure that, um, that the appointments are made and that there's, uh, that, that you go, right. Is the role for socialization is your loved one kind of stuck in the house because they can't get out and is your job just to to show up and have dinner with mom and dad or grandma and grandpa or whoever it is um, and get them engaged so that they're not isolated covid was really tough for a lot of people because everyone was was isolated and that really the legal yeah. issues are powers attorney healthcare proxies and advanced directives in place or are you gonna don't wait till there's a crisis right these these are so important and we're gonna have someone speak down the road about the legal issues that we really need to to put in place uh, before there's a crisis and what about the financial piece who's paying the bills you know, like, what if some of the bills are being forgotten or if someone, God forbid, goes into the hospital, like my dad's in the hospital, who's paying them? Well, I'm going out there to help my mom, right? Just to make sure that something's in place so that things don't slip. And those, people don't think about that stuff, right? That That's just family. So who so who fills these roles, right? So there's different options here. I'm, we're going to go talk. We're going to talk about the different options. Is it going to be family and friends, right? 
who um who's going to do all these things and what is expected of them is it should the adult should an adult child live with with the parents or should the should the senior live with the kids or a hybrid right what's expected how much time is considered because you got to consider that that adult child you know they have a life too maybe they're working maybe they have kids they're squeezed it's the sandwich generation right they're dealing with their children uh, who might be adult children and their parents who need more and more help um will this affect whose lives will be affected you know so these are things you need to consider if you're relying on friends and family you need to let them know what's expected and what you need if once we've gotten to the point where family can't fill those needs um, we may want to have somebody from the outside come in um, now how can we do that we can hire somebody privately I, my neighbor had somebody and they were really wonderful. And now the, that person's uh, moved out of the neighborhood and I got their phone number and we brought them in. Or I met somebody at church who knew somebody. Just the word of mouth network. You have to define when do we need them? How, how long are the shifts? And piece together what their work schedule is. How are you going to pay them? What is, you know, what's the cost? You're negotiating the, the, the price of what they're doing. Are there liability issues? If somebody is helping you at home or helping a loved one at home and they injure their back while helping lift somebody out of bed, is your homeowner's insurance going to cover that? You, it, it, these things are easily solved, but they're things that you need to look at. Uh, what's a backup plan? Uh, if somebody can't come, snow day today. What if you got the phone call today and that caregiver couldn't make it? What's the plan? Is somebody in jeopardy? And what are we going to do if that happens? Now, if all these things sound like you're being an employer, it's because you are. And, and this is the real big thing to think about hiring somebody privately. Technically, you are. Um, so you are responsibility, uh, responsible for those insurance pieces, for any background check that would need to be done if you felt that prudent. Um, you would need to worry about uh, withholding taxes if you chose to do that. Now, we're not going to get judgmental on this or get best practices, but understand that if you pay somebody, people say, I like to pay them under the table. Um, and that's all well and good. But if that person leaves your employment and reports to the Department of Labor that they're now looking for unemployment insurance, they're going to ask them who their last employer was because they want to make sure that employer was paying for their unemployment insurance. And when they name your name and they come looking for that insurance premium and you haven't paid it, you are technically on the hook for it. Um, so just be aware of it if you're going to go through uh, and, and pursue something privately. So you can hire someone privately, as Paul said, but you know, just be aware of, of what you need to do. Or you can go through an agency, right? The home care agency is a licensed home care agency. They're going to be responsible for um, if someone doesn't show up to find a replacement to doing those background checks and all the payroll and um, all the liability. So that's not you. It's all on them. Right. Um, so what you need to think about is how often do you need someone to come to your home to help you and how long are the shifts now home care agencies, especially because of staffing issues. They've increased their, their minimum time for a caregiver, to, to usually up to at least six hours a day because you know they need to have a good steady gig and there's not enough people out there to be caregivers, sadly. Um, so we need to keep in mind, you know, how long do you need them? What do you need them to do? What can they do and what shouldn't they do? That's a big thing. We kind of expect them to be able to do everything, but they really can't. They can give you med reminders, but they can't give you meds but you got to be careful about that. How much does it cost? Uh, the average home care agency right now is anywhere between, I hear a 28 to $45 an hour. So you do the math, how much can you afford and how, how are you going to pay for and it? And just to underline something that Susan said, and this applies for the private hire um, or through the agency, is think about the person that's working with you. Okay. And I use working with you because this is somebody you're bringing into your home to take care of a loved one. Um, be a good boss. And also understand why it needs to be, uh, you can't just get two hours a day. Two hours a day, we get a request for that a lot. I'd let just somebody get me started in the morning and then leave. Well, across five days, that's 10 hours of work at a relatively low uh, hourly rate. Um, how is that person living? You know, what they're going to have to get other jobs and they're going to be less and less reliable for you. And you may get different people filling the role. Um, it's really just logical, but 
if you haven't been through it before, you don't think of it in those terms. Um, are you a good boss? Are you always complaining to this person, uh, treating them like they're an outsider? This is someone taking care of a loved one. Um, be res be respectful and understand the situations that, that they're in. You decide that for whatever reason, family, um, private hire or an agency isn't right, and we're looking for um, help outside of the home, we'll give you now a view of some of the things that uh, you, you can or should consider. Sometimes things just, running the house just becomes too much. Um, we have to worry about repairs. Um, we have people coming in to fix things. We have to take care of the lawn, the driveway today, getting, getting shoveled, um, things freezing up, um, that we have to react to those household emergencies. And sometimes that can just be a little too much, a little too stressful. It has nothing to do with anybody's frailty. It's just a lot to handle. Um, so if that becomes too much, we're going to be looking for out-of-home solutions. There is a quick hybrid we'll mention here, and that's adult daycare. Um, and there's one in Nor the nearest ones are probably Norwalk. There's one Elder House. And I want you to consider this is just like daycare where somebody goes to uh, a facility uh, that has events all day long, uh, has a nurse on staff, has the capacity to bathe people if necessary, to administer meds that gives somebody a breather uh, through, through the day without being the same cost of saying, having somebody in a house. And I'll give you one little anecdote of uh, a way that a family we worked with uh, engaged adult day was that they had a loved one that needed eight hours of care a day and that was fine, they were managing that. But when the need became that they needed somebody 24 um, seven, this was this particular person was somebody had dementia and they started to become a wander risk. And so they felt they needed to have somebody with them 24 seven, but the cost was really prohibitive, but they wanted to stay at home. And the solution we came up with was to have, they had that eight hours of home care. We shifted it from the day to the overnight. And during the day, we went to adult day and the family was able to cobble something together. So on the financial end, they kept it together and they increased their coverage for their loved one and their safety for the loved one. So now a little bit more about, but if that doesn't work, that's sort of that hybrid between actually leaving the home and staying in it. What are the types of places that we're going to be talking about? We're going to talk about places in terms of their licensure with the state. Um, people say, use terms like independent living. When we talk about it, it's about the, that building has a license as an independent community. A lot of people start saying, you know, I want an independent place. Well, for an independent apartment to us is a place in Avalon. You know, it's a, just an apartment and that's that's what you get. We're talking about places where that are part of a care strategy. And there are actually places that are licensed as independent living that will pro provide a modicum of services that we'll get into. There are CCRCs, which are continuing care retirement communities. Nearest ones you may be aware of would be Meadow Ridge, uh, Edge Hill in, in Stanford. We have uh, assisted living, memory care, and skilled nursing and home um, care. To give you an idea of how how big this area is, that within 10 miles of New Canaan, there are 24 assisted livings and 13, we call them skilled nursing facilities or nursing homes. I think a lot of people would be surprised at that number. And the reason is pretty simple, it's demographics. The baby boomers hit 75 in 2020, and there are a lot of people who are living longer and there's statistical glut of people that are going to be faced with these care issues. And these companies have responded to that and 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 what the demands of the systems are. So we're going to go in depth a little bit more into what these are. So a CCRC, uh, we use a lot of acronyms in this business, Continuing Care Retirement Community. Uh, Edge Hill, Meadow Ridge, uh, 30, uh, 3030 Park, the watermark in Bridgeport, those are the three that are really around here. We don't have that many of them. They, they're buy-ins, right? So you they have a continuum of care that includes independent living apartment, and you can progress across the continuum to assisted living, memory care and skilled nursing. It's all in that one campus, right? Um, but you have a buy-in. So let's say you want to get um, a two-bedroom apartment at um, at Edge Hill, right? It might cost you a million, million and a half dollars, something like that. And then they're going to have, but what you're buying is a life care contract so that you can progress across that continuum and you'll get a return uh, depending on the contract. It might be an 80% or 90% return. Sometimes it's 50%. It depends on the building. 
Um, and that money will go back to your state after, um, after you sell it. But you still have a monthly amount that you have to pay. So let's say you spend a million dollars on this apartment. Um, maybe your monthly fee is somewhere between you know eight thousand dollars a month. You're paying that every month. And um, but then as you progress across the continuum to assisted living, you're paying that eight thousand. Memory care, eight thousand. Skilled nursing, eight thousand. So that's kind of like a hedge in a long-term care policy. You know what you're going to be paying, but it's a huge buy-in. That is that's something. As I said, it's not. That popular up here, a lot more down south, like in Florida, things like that. Um, but there, it is an option, right, to be able to have that that the access to uh, to the continuum. What tends to happen though is that people love their their apartment that they buy, and they don't progress, right, and so they stay, and then they need home care. That's just something you know to think about. The other options are independent living. You know, two different types. Uh, we talk about senior housing, uh, you know, subsidized housing. Uh, they're really long wait lists. There's a few uh, in New Canaan that we do know about, know about that, that's listed here. If you want a full list of those senior housing apartments, you can go off of the um, Southwest Connecticut Area and Aging web website known as SWACA. They can give you the full list uh, town by town, the list of, um, of, um, of housing, senior housing. There's also what was Paul was mentioning before, independent living, licensed independent living. Some examples are um, uh, the Inn, right? The Inn at Waveney, um, Atri Darian, uh, the Waterstone High Ridge. They literally have independent living apart apartments. That basically means there's a there's usually a full kitchen, but you um, and you have some care available to you as well. So assisted livings. Um, so the independent living apartments too, those are month to month rentals. It's a rental model versus what we were talking about with those CCRCs, which is the buy-in, right? So um, assisted livings, as I said, they're month to month rentals, apartments, studios, one bedrooms, two bedrooms, you have kitchenettes, okay? All your meals are included, transportation to and from doctor's appointments, out trips, um, activities, laundry facilities, um, medication management and care is available based on assessment. So there's a nurse there on staff, they can do an assessment so that you don't have to go get that aid, right? And do that six hour minimum. The care is available in the building. And some places can do lower care, you know, very much of a social model. And some places can do very, very high care, two person assist, toilets, lifts, diabetes management, all, I mean, everything. Um, some examples that we have here, Brightview, the Maple Woods, Atrias, Brookdale, Sunrise, LCB, the Residences, and um, the Greens of Cannondale. Those are the ones that uh, you probably all heard uh, about. And it really does allow you to be as independent as you want to be. Uh, care is delivered in the privacy of your, home, of, of your apartment or as needed throughout the community. How much does it cost? People ask me this every day. What's it going to cost? And it really depends. It is real estate. Depends on the size of the apartment, where you are, and your level of care. Uh, so it really, really depends. Uh, I, I, I never like to answer that question. Do you? Because no. <laughs> it's 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 bespoke. Depends. It really depends. Within assisted livings, there is a classification of a part of the building that's dedicated to memory care, and this is a section of the of the community that is specific to the needs of somebody who may have a cognitive impairment or dementia. A lot of times this has to, these will have to do with safety risks. If somebody's a wander risk, so they could be very, very high functioning. It could carry on a conversation and, and be very, very engaging. Um, but every once in a while, they sort of get the idea that it'd be a good idea to walk out the front door and maybe go to work, even though they've been retired for 20 years. Um, and when you have a situation like that, the way that you can best work with that is to have it be a secure part of the community. And so there'd be a keypad punch in, a keypad punch out. But inside, it's very welcoming and warm. It's not like a ward or a unit. It does not feel like a hospital or clinical setting. Um, you'll have a studio apartment that's your own, and you'll have a lot of common spaces that feel very homey, um, and that will allow you to advance along the continuum. Because what we know about dementia is that it's a progressive disease of the brain. Um, and you're not going to stay at a certain level for forever. So we want to find a place that as our cognitive ability diminishes, um, that we're in a place we're comfortable in and where those people around us and who know our idiosyncrasies and know our wants and desires um, and are taking care of us um, 
can stay with us across the entire uh, an entire trip or uh, across the continuum. Now we have in each of the communities that Susan mentioned before in assisted living, they'll all have a memory care because just as, as it will happen as some people will move into an assisted living and be highly independent and over a period of time, they may develop a cognitive impairment. And it would be a shame if they had to move from the friends they had met, the met and the familiar surroundings that, uh, uh, that they were living in. And so uh, they all have nice little names for their the neighborhoods uh, that are memory care neighborhoods, like re reminiscence and reflection and harbor. And then we also have a couple of options that are memory care only. And so there is no assisted living component to them. There is just for memory care. And they're really wonderful. You all, I mean, you're all very well aware of the village, which was really on the cutting edge of developing what this does. And it creates an entire community um, that is dedicated to the service and care of those with a cognitive impairment. And the benefits of, of that include that the entire staff is used to working with um, and caring for those who have a cognitive impairment, right down to the cook staff and the cleaning staff. So they know when they're cleaning an apartment that they can look for signs that something may be amiss and they're coordinated in their reporting back to the care staff on that. The other piece of this too is that, you know, with, as Paul says, it is a progressive disease. So a lot of times people with dementia don't have the ability to to uh, express their needs and wants. So it tends to be higher staffed um, and a, a smaller a smaller neighborhood as we call them, right? So, um, so and that's the bigger piece is the staffing. There's, there's tends to be more staff and hence the, the price tends to be, mm -hmm. you know, higher, right? And if you, if, for those of you who've been to see the, the, the village, that's the con, the physical construct um, is, is also designed for this type of care. And the idea that people come down to Main Street in, in Waveney, and yes, that's where all the activities are, but for a good portion of the day, it means you may have a majority of the residents in that general area and a fewer number of caregivers can keep an eye on many more people. Yeah. Um, so it's just safer, again, with giving them the dignity of um, as to be as independent as they can be. So it doesn't have to be somebody hovering over them. There's somebody maybe at a distance that's got an eye on them in case they look um, like they're having a little bit of trouble um, or maybe becoming a little disoriented or or upset. Yeah, or they need toileting, right? It's a, mm -hmm. Yeah, they, this way they're not in their rooms and getting, in, I don't want to say getting into trouble because they can't necessarily say what they need. Mm -hmm. Now, a big difference, the, ne the next piece we're going to talk about is, is skilled nursing or the colloquially at the nursing home. The, the clinical term is a skilled nursing facility. Um, and Waveney has the care center. There's Wilton Meadows and Autumn Lake over in Norwalk, along with Notre Dame and Cassana Norwalk. Those are just a, a, a couple of samples. I want to make it the, the distinction between assisted living, including the memory care under the assisted living umbrella, and skilled nursing. Uh, because a lot of people stumble with this. They say, oh, you know, my mom's really forgetful. She needs a nursing home. Well, a nursing home or skilled nursing facility is designed for the delivery of skilled nursing care. That means we need a licensed clinician to lay hands on us in delivering the care. Examples of that would be wound care. You might need intravenous, or you might need drugs that were titrated or, or adjusted based on what's going on in, in, in the moment. Um, those uh, breathing apparatus, uh, feeding tubes, uh, those are skilled care. Care we talk about before when we talked before about activities of daily living. You don't need a nurse to lay hands on you to help you with dressing or bathing or toileting or transferring. What you really need is the level of care you need is with an aid. And so that's the big difference is if you need help with activities of daily living. And I'll think about this for a moment with that transferring piece. And Susan mentioned it before, the idea of a Hoyer lift or that you needed two people to help you get in and out of bed and in and out of a chair, on and off a toilet. You know, that's a lot of manpower, but it doesn't have to be a nurse. Um, so you can leave a very dignified life with a lot of care in a very comfortable non-clinical setting um, in assisted living. And they've all sort of adjusted to it. The demands of an aging population and higher care needs, they've had to react to it. Um, so the skilled care needs, 
um, are the big differentiator between a nursing home, skilled nursing facility, and assisted living. There are two sides to a skilled nursing facility. There's short-term rehab. So if I fall on the ice outside and I break my hip, have surgery, and I need a little physical therapy, I need some physical therapy to get me back on my feet, I might be discharged to uh, rehab. Um, that's part of my care plan. It's actually a prescription that says, hey, you know, Paul needs to go to the hospital from the hospital to rehab so that we can get him walking on his own. And that's the goal. And that's the prescription, just like they might give you amoxicillin for 30 days for an infection or something that it's you have a rehab assignment. And once you're or a, a prescription and once you're there, that's what your goal is. Now, this gets to be insurance driven a bit. Um, so that if you hit that goal, I'm walking 50 feet and I say, okay, that's great. You're safe to go back home now. Or I get a little cranky, you know, it's painful doing this rehab. I just don't want to do it today. And I, and I don't want to do it tomorrow. Or if I get stuck and I plateaued and maybe after all the rehab, I could go 25 feet and they had to reevaluate and say, you know what, we're not going to be able to get him to 50 feet. So he's, he's plateaued at 25. And in all those cases, they're going to report back to Medicare that he's hit the goal. The prescription is over and the coverage will stop. So you could stay, but now we're going to be private pay. And that private pay in a skilled nursing facility is going to be five in this area, 500 to $700 a day. The other side of these healthcare centers, these skilled nursing facilities is long-term. And that is somebody who might need some of these skilled needs in perpetuity, you know, for the rest of the way. Uh, it's also a place where people who are, have run out of funds will go for a modicum of care because they can convert to Medicaid. And we'll get into Medicaid in a little bit, but that's the way we use skilled nursing. When we have a skilled need, when we're there for rehab, or we're there long-term and we don't have the resources. The 64,000 or $64 million question, how do we pay for all of this? So we start with private pay. Um, you know, insurance, Medicare will pay for hospital stays. It will pay for that rehab, which is a prescription, other prescriptions, doctor visits. It does not pay for long-term room and board. Um, it is a pres for prescribed fixed lengths of time and fixed lengths of service. It doesn't pay for assisted living. And it does not pay for assisted living. Um, and it does not pay for long-term in uh, a skilled nursing facility. So private pay. Um, long-term care policies, whether you're paying for home care, um, or for any of these out-of-home uh, options um, is covered by long-term care policies. And you have to look carefully and understand when your policy kicks in and what's its value. A couple of things you want to look for, um, a daily and lifetime cap, because they'll tell you for what services they're willing to reimburse you on a daily um, and annual basis. Uh, and there may be some calculation on that. And how do you how do you use it? Do you have to stretch it out? Um, most of the policies today are very different than the ones uh, of those who may have gotten them in the '90s or the 2000s. And those were you know use it or lose it policies. Okay, they don't have a cash value to them, so it's really advantageous to use that relatively aggressively. And you should know about that. And you need to know about what. Uh, what puts you on claim. And it usually has something to do with those activities of daily living. If a dementia diagnosis, that's usually um, a check all the boxes and, and qualify you for a claim. Um, or it'll be a combination of you need help with two or three of those activities of daily living. Um, and again, it can be a relatively low threshold. I go back to the compression socks. That's assistance with dressing. So that may be five minutes a day, but if I don't get those compression socks on, uh, I'm not receiving the medical care that I need. Um, so that would check a box. Um, there is- Emily, I am fried out of my mind right now. Benefit Please. from uh, the Veterans Administration called aid and attendance, very little known uh, benefit. Uh, then this is a stipend to uh, subsidize care in the home. Um, it is available for veterans and their spouses, uh, including a surviving spouse. 
Um, it has a much lower threshold for or a much easier threshold to get across than Medicaid does for getting the, uh, the access to it based on the income and asset thresholds. Um, so it is very accessible. Uh, we see a lot of people who served during the Korea conflict and say, well, you know, I never went to Korea. Well, my dad served in a Korean conflict and he was in Dusseldorf the entire time, his two years. Uh, but he would have qualified. Um, he just needed to have an honorable discharge and have served uh, for a period of time, and one day of which had to include a time where the Department of Defense said we were in a period of war or combat. Um, so that's something to keep in the back of your head, whether you're staying at home or um, looking out of home. Reverse mortgages. You know, we get into these tricky things, but those are uh, things that people consider. If you look into reverse mortgage and using the YEC, you know, a lot of people are um, have these wonderful homes and it's their biggest asset and how to activate it um, to help pay for care. Uh, that's a way to do it. We do it with consultation so that you're doing it strategically. So you know what happens as you eat through the equity. Um, it can be a very, very effective strategy if we manage it properly. There is an as there is an estate planning level to this. Um, Medicaid will come in to, to play for people, even with people who have some means. Um, Medicaid has income and asset thresholds uh, that you have to be really quite low uh, to qualify for it. Um, but at the cost of $700 a day, Let's do the math, you could be talking almost a quarter of a million dollars a year. That'll make a lot of people poor very quickly. Medicaid, to qualify for Medicaid, you can't just sign away your house or give your kids a big gift or move it to um, another, move your assets to another person. Medicaid, when you apply, will look back at your financial history for five years and they'll want to know what everything, uh, where everything went. Um, because they really want to make sure you've contributed everything you have. A real basic thing, Medicare, Medicaid, people slip on this sometimes. Five years, the, sorry, five year look back. The, I'm just looking at this okay. right now. Yeah. yeah, the Medicaid look back is five years. That Medicare is a health insurance. Medicaid is uh, an entitlement program and, it, um, and you have to qualify for it financially. That Susan mentioned before, uh, the Southwestern Connecticut Area uh, Agency on Aging um, has a great program. Um, where Medicaid can uh, help with care in the home. That's the Connecticut Home Care Program for the Elderly. Again, there are qualifications for it. SWAC is a terrific organization for doing that. We also have a lot of resources within New Canaan to help you access these services. We really wish there was a, they become the clearinghouse. You wish that the government just had one place to go. They don't, but we do have these wonderful uh, local resources that can that that can help guide us through them. Yeah. And so that's so you see they're brought this is a this is a big burden on people and there are a lot of different ways to skin this cat. Um, and these are the the ones that generally people use. In summary, <laughs> uh, so care is different things for different people, right? This is not cookie cutter. Or I mean, everybody everybody has different needs, and it means different things for different people. You really need to have a conversation before a crisis. Don't let there be a crisis, and then you try and figure it all out. It's important to have a conversation now, and continue to have this conversation about what your needs are and how you want them to be fulfilled? Who's going to be involved? When do we need to move to in-home care? What about changes in the future? Once again, you don't know when things are going to happen. We wish we had, we wish we could see the future, ball, yeah. have a crystal ball, but we don't, you know, things happen. Please plan. It's your decision. <laughs> Please plan. So many people don't. Um, but if you do, you know, if you do need someone, we're always here to help. Um, just a phone call away. Yeah, and that planning, I mean, New Canaan is pretty special in this yeah. because between staying, you know, staying put in the social services and if you went to the at the Connecticut level or state level with, with SWACA and a number of the professionals that we're going to be bringing in over the next six months, that these are resources. They're really good, vetted local people who are very giving of their time. They're excellent professionals and clinicians, but they're also just good hearts. And that's why we're bringing this series out there for this opportunity to have the conversation conversation and get you connected to the resources. Because as you see this, I mean, we ran through this in 45 minutes. Um, and I'm sure we have a billion questions and a, and a bunch of heads that are just spinning. Um, but